Um, let's read together from uh, the book of Luke, chapter 9, if you will turn there, please. Luke 9, and we're beginning in verse 28. New, starting a new section today, it says, Now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this wonderful passage. We pray that as we study it over the next few weeks, we will understand it and apply it and that it will have the effect in our lives that you desire. We understand that all of this, Father, is to help us have a correct view of you, which is that you are a very big God working in a very great way in a very fallen world. And so we want to be part of what you're doing, and we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this passage is one of the, uh, I think, one of the strangest in the Bible. It's not an easy passage, but I have to tell you, I love this passage of Scripture, and I love the message that it has. From our earthborn perspective, it almost seems bizarre, right? But, but really, that's the point of this passage. It is otherworldly. It's an otherworldly event. This is nothing less than a preview of the kingdom of God. This event, purposely in Luke's gospel, follows what has just come before that we've been studying. Notice what he says in verse 28. It says, now about eight days after these things, he took Peter and James and John and went up to the mountain to pray. After these things positions this chronologically for us, right? And, and, and it takes us back to verse 18, where Peter makes this wonderful confession that Jesus is the Christ of God. And then, if you recall, Jesus commends him for this, but then he turns and lets, the, lets these disciples know that he's on his way to Jerusalem to suffer and die. Well, that's, you know, that, that, just didn't, that, that just threw the disciples for a loop. They've just confessed that he's the Messiah. He's just acknowledged that that's true. But now he tells them, I'm going to go die. These things are incompatible in their mind. The coming of the kingdom and the death of the king. It just, you know, it just doesn't add up. It's like a couple years ago, you know, if they had come and announced, hey, Peyton Manning is coming, Bronco fans, he's going to lead us to the Super Bowl, right? And then Peyton gets up and says, oh, by the way, I have terminal cancer. I mean, you just, those are two things that just don't jibe, right? They don't fit together. And so we have to understand in the context here that the disciples are going to struggle with this. And that's not the worst of it. Because now he turns around in verse 23 and he says, by the way, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So he's saying, guys, not only am I going to die, but you're going to have to die as well. You're going to have to die to self so that from this point forward, it's my agenda. It's my mission. It's my will accomplished in my way. And then he turns around in verse 26 and he tells them that somehow he's going to be coming in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And then in verse 27, he tells them there are some standing here who will never taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So in a matter of 
of minutes, Jesus has affirmed that he's the Messiah. Then he said he's going to go to Jerusalem and, and die. Then he says that he's going to come in glory with the holy angels. And, you know, the disciples' heads are spinning, you know, like a top by this point in time. They're not exactly Phi Beta Kappa anyway, right? But they do know this. They know that a dead man can't lead a revolution. So Jesus gives them kind of a week to absorb all this. Now we're eight days later, and he takes Peter and John and James up on this mountain with them to pray. And as they pray, as he prays, they take a nap. It's kind of a harbinger of things to come in Gethsemane, right? This is, this is normal for them as we see. But when they wake up, man, when they wake up, boy, all heaven has broken loose. I mean, they look up and there, sits, there stands Jesus in dazzling white, everything, his clothing, his face, his body, his appearance is just totally bright white. He sit, he's standing there in a blaze of glory and he's not alone. He has two men with him. He's talking to Moses and to Elijah. So he's not alone and they're discussing what? His coming death. So, I mean, how bizarre can it get? This is something that's totally supernatural, and yet here they are talking about death. Well, what's going on here to position this for us so that we can have some understanding is that this is an amazing demonstration, beloved, of the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God in preview form. You say, how do you know that? Well, look at, look at where this where this is positioned, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those gospel writers have this account of what's called the transfiguration of Jesus. And they all position it right after a statement like we find in verse 27, where Jesus says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. A lot of people have struggled with, well, what does that mean? Some of them aren't gonna die before they see the kingdom of God. But when you understand that right after that comment in the context, we get this event, you see that what this is is a preview of the kingdom of God and these three men are seeing it. So this is a preview of coming attractions. And it's given at this point, it's a very timely point in the life of Christ to let everybody know that God is in charge despite how things are gonna look, and to let everybody know that in the end, for those who believe in Christ, things are gonna come out right at the end. What, what God is teaching here is he's showing that the glory at the end will justify the pain that has to come, and that is going to come before this end comes. And so we're going to look the, the next few weeks at this wonderful passage under the outline, the purpose of the preview, the person of the preview, and then the portents or the conditions of the preview, what it teaches us about the kingdom. Today, we want to look at the purpose. It's twofold, twofold. First of all, this preview of the kingdom is given in order to encourage the disciples, to encourage the disciples to build hope in their life. This is kind of a hope generator, if you will, that God is giving these men. These guys are mentally rattled. Messiah has just announced himself, but now he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go die. And they're asking, really? I mean, I mean, who is this that we're following? Is this worth it? You have to remember, these guys have given up their homes. They've given up their means of living by this time. They are following Jesus every day. He's the only thing in their life. He overshadows everything. And now he's saying, I'm going to go die. And they're asking, well, so what are we doing here? I mean, what's the point of all of this? They're not getting it. And their question is, is Jesus really big enough to trust? It's the same question that's going to come to us over and over in our lives, right? Is this Jesus that we say we serve, that we think we follow, that we believe we've committed our life to? Is he big enough? Can he be trusted even when we don't understand? And God's trying to give an answer here that says absolutely he is. Some of you may be familiar with, a, with, an, with an author named Oz Guinness. Oz Guinness. Os Guinness 
is a Brit by birth, although he was actually born in China. He's an American by choice. Now he lives in Florida. Was part of the Labrie uh, um, uh, operation in Switzerland under Francis Schaeffer during the 70s and 80s that some of you may be familiar with. He's a keen observer of culture. He's written, written many scintillating books on Christianity and culture. And he's, he's a, he observes that Christianity in America today, we're kind of in a stupor of ease and comfort. He says we're secular to the core, even in our churches. And he notes that we, you know, we're using, what are we using? We're using business worldly methods to get people in. We're appealing to worldly senses, telling people, listen, just come to Christ and he'll meet whatever need it is you have financially, relationship, or whatever else. We never tell people the true gospel. That to follow Jesus is to die to self. It's to be ready for whatever may come our way. Repeating the promises that Jesus made that if he's persecuted, we will be persecuted as well. So we're not being truthful. He goes on and he writes this. He says, we have, listen to this, we have too much to live with, too much to live with, and too little to live for. Everything is permitted and nothing is important. I, man, I, let me tell you, he hits the nail right on the head with those comments. When we finally see, and you know, after weeks and months that we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, I don't know whether it's sunk in yet, but when we, when we finally see it, it finally comes through to us that Jesus demands everything. When that finally gets through to us, we're gonna be asking the same question the disciples are asking, is he worth it? Because that's what he's asking, beloved. Is he worth it? So let's look at how God is answering that question with these men right here. Verse 28, it says, now about eight days after these things, he took them, Peter, we took with him Peter, James, and John, probably three because truth is confirmed by two or three witnesses in that culture. He didn't take all the apostles, he just took these two or three. And he went up to the mountain to pray. Now what is this driving need to pray with these men at this point in time? Well, we get a huge hint if you just turn back to the book of Matthew, go past Luke going backwards to Matthew, chapter 26. When you get to Matthew 26, we have, we've arrived at the night before the Lord is gonna be crucified, right? And beginning in verse 36, we see how he takes these disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. This is happening just a very few weeks after what we're reading about in Luke. It says, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Of course, you know, the story, they couldn't stay awake. But what we see here is that in his humanity, Jesus is recoiling from the death that's about to come. Now this is the night before that's in Matthew 26. He realizes the iniquity of all of us is gonna be laid on him. No harder task has ever been asked of anyone. But see, if you go back to Luke, when we're in chapter nine here, just a few weeks before, this is already, this is already becoming heavy on his mind. These last few weeks, of Jesus' life, he knows where this is all leading. And so as his ministry is winding down here on earth, he's facing the cross and the burden that that brings to him is intense. We're gonna to get to the end of chapter nine in Luke and look at verse 51 of Luke nine. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. It's a strong term, right? It's the same kind of term we would use when we say somebody set their face like flint or something to go do something. Jesus was on his way and he was determined that he was gonna see this through, but it was not an easy thing that he was facing. His coming death haunts him. 
And so he goes to the Father in prayer. He also knows he's got a group of apostles out here who aren't getting this, not even close. He knows that. And so he prays. He prays for encouragement for them, and he prays for encouragement for him. And boy, what an answer. What an answer. Because look at this, verse 29, in answer to his prayer. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And the two men who stood with him. I mean, this, this sets a new standard of amazement, right? When they opened their eyes and saw what was going on here. The disciples in their own minds are still trying to decipher, how is it that a dead man is going to lead the kingdom of God? What? They just didn't see the compatibility. We know that they didn't expect Jesus to die, certainly didn't expect him to rise again. So how they interpreted these clear phrases that he gave them, I don't know. Apparently they thought he was talking in metaphors or talking in some strange terms. But here on this mountain, suddenly they're seeing Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about the same death that they can't get their arms around. So Moses and Elijah know too, they're in this as well. This is a revelation to them. I mean, this is incredible. So now Peter tries to speak, but the father immediately interrupts him and says, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. In other words, Peter, shut up and listen. Pay attention. Disciples, if they were watching here, knew that they still didn't understand it. Everything they were seeing was foreign to them, just like it would be foreign to us. They didn't know how to put two and two together. But here's here's the message that they were to get, and it's the same message we need to get. They needed to understand, and as I believe these three did when they left here, that listen, we may not understand this death that Jesus is talking about. We may not understand the kingdom the way we thought it was going to come. But what they could see is, hey, we got these Old Testament saints, we have Jesus that we trust, and we have God the Father, and they seem to be all in concurrence on this. So who are we to question it? We just need to trust. This is a big God. So let's trust him. That's where God is trying to take them. This is like hope written in bright lights without giving them all the answers. This is exactly, beloved, where we've got to go. When, you know, there's somebody at work that's mistreating us, when there's some setback that we've had, when Melody calls at whatever time at night and says, I'm not going to be there tomorrow. I mean, what do we do? We put our trust in the Lord, right? This is where we have to go with the issues that we don't know what else to do with. He's in charge. What Jesus is doing here, let me, let me try and illustrate it this way. 1952, a young woman named Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters off Catalina Island. It's an island about 26 miles off the coast of Orange County, California, where we used to live. You've all heard the song, I'm sure. So she stepped into the water of the, of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina to swim the 26 miles, she wanted to become the first woman to swim the 26 miles from the island to the mainland. It was a cold day, and the water was cold. The Pacific is always cold. It was foggy. It was so foggy that she could hardly see the support boats that were right alongside her as she made this journey. But she stepped in, and she began to swim. Fifteen hours later, she was begging to be taken out. She just was so tired, but her mother was along, and her mother urged her on. He said, she said, Florence, just keep going. I know you can make it. Just, just it's, you know, you're close. Just keep going. And so for another hour, she plugged away until she finally just stopped. She just quit. She was emotionally and physically done. And they pulled her into the boat. But she was very discouraged when she found out shortly after they got in the boat, land became visible. They were within a half a mile of land when she was pulled in. And she said this. She said, all I could see was the fog. Ever feel that way? All I could see was the fog. She said, I think if I could have just seen the shore, I could have made it. 
A lot of truth in that statement, isn't there? That's what Jesus is doing here. He's showing them the shore. Guys, this is where we're going. Take hope. Yeah, I know you don't understand it all. I know you don't get it all. I know some of it is different than you anticipated. In fact, I know just about all of it's different than you anticipated. But there's a plan. We're going somewhere. You can see the shore. And believe me, these guys never forgot this. Both John and Paul, James was killed early in his ministry, as you know, but John, John and uh, Peter both write about this later. This is what John was writing about when he said in John 1.14, and the word became flesh, Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I think John had more in mind than just this instance, but he surely had this instance in mind. Peter for sure did. When he wrote these words, 1 Peter 1, verse 17, he says, For, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him in the holy mountain. Peter remembered it. And in 1 Peter 1, when he had to write to believers who were under severe persecution, this is one of the things that he brought to mind. He's showing them the shore. And so just as, Jesus, just as God the Father gave this to the disciples to encourage them, so they are now encouraging others, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. There's the shore out ahead. But the second purpose of this preview, I think, was to encourage Jesus himself. Now, that may sound strange that Jesus would need encouragement, but beloved, remember that he's living his earthly life with the resources of his human nature only. He's not appealing to his divine nature. It's there. It's I, the best way I know to describe it. It's on time out while he's here on earth and he's, he's living his life as a man and he was sobered by the human cruelty that he knew awaited him when he got to Jerusalem. Even worse, he knew that he was about to become sin for us and he was about to be relationship that he had with the Father was about to be separated. The anticipation of that fact had become a mind-boggling burden to him by this time. It was ever in front of him, even as he went through his ministry. So he did what he always did. He went to the Father in prayer. And the Father answered with this amazing display to reassure Jesus, even as he went to his destiny, that he was doing the right thing and that he went with the Father's full approval. This is an encouragement not only for the disciples, but it's an encouragement to Jesus. You know, we will we'll never understand, we will never understand in this life, maybe not in the next, what it cost the Father and the Son to provide the salvation that we so enjoy. But it's for sure that there was perfect concurrence between Father and Son about the necessity and the urgency of what was about to happen. Anybody tells you the cross wasn't necessary? Anybody tells you the cross was just a kind of a, kind of a tragedy, tragic act of history, beloved? Don't ever believe them. This was a purposeful, intentional act to provide salvation for a fallen mankind. And as Jesus went there, both he and the Father were suffering the pain that was going to come from this event. So the Father addresses Jesus' human need for encouragement in three ways. Three ways. First of all, he, encouraged, he was encouraged by the glory to come. He was encouraged by the glory to come. Notice verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. What is this? This, beloved, is the deity of Christ shining through. This is the deity of Christ. This is the, his godness, if you will, overcoming the human veil that, it's, that, it's been, that is hidden at all this time and that will hide it again as soon as this is over with, but showing for one brief shining moment who he really is. 
This is his glory shining through. This is the glory that Jesus shared with the Father before time ever began. It's the glory that he will share with the Father again when, this is, when the mission is done. And if you want to know how encouraging this was to Jesus, just turn over to John 17. John 17. If you're in Luke, just one, one, uh, one book forward. 17th chapter of John. Again, we're, now we're again on the night before Jesus is crucified. As he's with his disciples, he begins to pray for them. And in John 17 and verse 5, here's what we read. Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I've had with you before the world existed. He had that for one moment of time during his earthly ministry. And now here he is the night before he's about to be crucified to take upon himself the sin of the world, saying to the Father, will you please glorify me again so that I can rejoin you in the glory that we've had together. And so as he prepares to go to the cross, he anticipates the permanent restoration of his glory as God that he's experienced before. You know, in the book of Hebrews 12, verse 2, just in case, you know, just in case you think the cross was fun for Jesus, or that he somehow looked forward to the cross. He did, but here's why. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us why. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus didn't go to the cross because it was fun, but he went to the cross because he could look beyond, because he could do what he asked us to do, which is to see beyond. And it was because of the joy that was set before him. It was because of the joy of the glory that he was going to experience again. It was because of the joy of the people who would be saved as a result that he went to the cross. Jesus knew that the cross wasn't the end. The cross was the means to the end. And so he was encouraged by the glory to come. Secondly, he was encouraged by those he will save. He's encouraged by those he will save. This is a really key part of this passage. Jesus has shared with his apostles what's coming, right? He's shared with them that he's going to die. He's even shared with them that he's going to rise again. They're not getting any of it. They don't understand it. In fact, at one point when Jesus said that, Peter pulled him aside and said, quit talking that way. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen. And of course, if Peter had had his way, Satan would have won the day and Jesus would have never gone to the cross, right? And that's why Jesus turned to him when on that occasion and said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's who's speaking through you. They're not getting it. And so from a human perspective, there's nobody who shares the burden that Jesus is now feeling very keenly. There's no human person who can come alongside and say, I understand. Jesus is going it alone already, even in the midst of the crowds. He reminds me of something that Hemingway wrote. Hemingway wrote this. He said, I, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug into. That's a metaphor I would have never thought of. But that creative mind thought of it. He said, it's just like being a vacuum tube that's totally useless, totally alone, totally no current going through it. That's how I feel. But there's a difference. There's a difference between Hemingway and Jesus. And that is Jesus knew where to plug in, right? And so he went to the Father. He said, Father, this is how I'm feeling. I'm alone in this. Jesus knew where to plug into. And so not only is he transfigured, a preview of the glory that's yet to come, but notice what else? Behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, in verse 30. Now, where did they come from? Where did they come from? They've been dead for centuries. Well, Moses has been dead for centuries. You may remember God sent the limo for Elijah. Remember that? He went to heaven in a, in a, in a fiery chariot, it tells us, in, uh, in first King, Second Kings 2. So this wasn't just some guys raised from the 
dead because Elijah had never been dead. What are these? These are two guys, beloved, that have come from heaven. They've come from heaven. They've come from the presence of God. That's where they've come from. Now, we're gonna, we'll talk about the implications of that later on, but notice in verse 31, it says, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, what he, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What's the departure? Departure is death. Departure is death. We speak of that. We speak of the dearly departed, right? What do we mean? Those who have died. And so it's, it's death. So they're in a discussion about death. Now, why? And here's why. It's because these two men, listen carefully now, these two men have come from heaven where they are residents on credit. On credit. They don't belong there. You say, what do you mean they don't belong there? How can Moses and Elijah not belong in heaven? The reason they don't belong in heaven, beloved, is the same reason you and I don't belong in heaven, because they were sinners, just like we are. They didn't belong in heaven. They sinned just like we do. They lived under the Mosaic covenant, the time of the law of Moses. And so what did they do? They offered sacrifices for their sins, right? And in doing so, they demonstrated their faith in God. And so they're in heaven because they have believed God, but they're in heaven on credit because their sin still hasn't been paid for. Why? Because of what Hebrews tells us. In Hebrews 10, I think it's verse 2, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, right? So what they did was trust God and use the symbolism that God gave them for the forgiveness of sins, but it didn't actually remove the penalty. Do you see? They're in heaven on credit. And so what they're talking to Jesus about is, thank God the time has come when the payment's gonna be made. And if that doesn't happen, they can't remain where they are. So why has God the Father sent these two men to Jesus? More than one reason, but one of the main ones is to, to say to Jesus, this is what it's all about. These men are resident with me today on credit, but now the bill must be paid. Time has come. The time is now. You must go to the cross. What bulls and goats can't do, you must do. The future of these men and of millions like them depends on what I'm now asking you to do. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 tells us that God made the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And what's happening at this transfiguration event is that God is telling Jesus, you've done the first part. You have now been made perfect through suffering. You have met every challenge without sin. So you are now the perfect lamb of God. You are an appropriate sacrifice, not for yourself, but for the sin of the world. You are the lamb who can cover once and for all, a phrase that you find throughout the New Testament in Romans and Hebrews, once and for all the sins of these men. Beloved, if you don't think that God loves you, I mean, if you're holding a grudge against God this morning for some reason, and I know some of you are, not because you've told me, but in an audience this size, we're there, holding a grudge against God because he took this person that I loved, or because he didn't do this thing the way I thought he should, or because he caused the crops to fail and I had to go find another career, or whatever the issue is, whatever the grudge is, you need to understand how much God loves you. Even though you may not understand why that event came into your life or those events came into your life, you've got to understand how much God loves you. This is God saying, I will provide at my own expense the payment for the sin that you can't pay for on your own. He loves you. Whatever it may look like, however much you can't explain the circumstances, God loves you. 
And here he is encouraging Jesus by saying, this is the reason that we must bear what we are going to endure. This is the reason that you must go through the physical pain and humiliation as well as the emotional and spiritual pain of being separated from me. You must go through that. This is the reason that I must suffer the pain, the intense, unbelievable pain of laying on you, imputing to you all the sins of all the people who have ever lived. You will become the murderer of all murderers, the rapist of all rapists, the child abuser of all child abusers. That's who you will become. Because if you don't, these men cannot be retained in heaven. And neither can the billions who are to follow be retained in heaven. You must go. This is what the transfiguration is about. The transfiguration, Jesus is being reminded that he will save those by his obedience. Those who will become, in the words of Paul, he will become the firstborn among many brothers. And among those many brothers is Moses and Elijah, the millions who are already in heaven, the millions who are to come, and you and me. And Jesus said, yes, I'm willing, I'll go. He was encouraged by those that he would save. Thirdly, he was encouraged by the Father's affirmation. He was encouraged by the Father's affirmation. Verse 34, as he, Peter, was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. This is holy ground. They are suddenly enveloped by this great cloud. It is no ordinary cloud. They realize that and they're scared to death. Moses knew immediately what it was. He recognized it as the Shekinah glory of God, the physical, visible presence of God here on earth. It was the same cloud that had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's the same cloud that had overshadowed the tabernacle that they built in the wilderness and then took up permanent residence over the mercy seat in the tabernacle to provide that temporary forgiveness from sin. It was the same cloud that had hovered over the mountain, Mount Sinai, as Moses was receiving the law from God. It was the same cloud that entered the wonderful, beautiful, amazing temple that Solomon built as he prayed at the dedication of that temple. And it's also the same cloud that left that temple 400 years later during the time of Ezekiel because of the idolatry of the people. It's a cloud that hadn't been seen by human eyes now for 600 years. And now it envelops these men. They're right in the presence of God. You can't get any closer than this. And then out of the cloud, the Father speaks and says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You know, there are three recorded instances in the New Testament where, the, where God the Father speaks aloud to his son. It's instructive to us as fathers. God the Father was encouraging his, sons at, his son at key points in his ministry. At the baptism of Christ, we hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Tremendous encouragement. Imagine hearing out of heaven, I'm pleased with you. Now he's saying at the time of the transfiguration when they're getting close, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And later on in the week, just before he dies, in John chapter 12, verse 27, at a particular moment, Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Imagine how meaningful that was for Jesus to hear that just at the moment when he's ready to run, humanly speaking. How precious. Just when he needed it most, there was the voice of God saying, you are on the right track. You're doing the right things. You're focused on saving others rather than saving yourself. 
This is why you've come. You've aligned yourself with the great eternal purpose to save fallen mankind, and I am delighted in you. How good is that? It reminds me, it reminds me of this rowdy, you know, six-year-old kid who was always in trouble. Some of you know that kid. Some of you have him living in your home, I know. He went to, he went to, he went to kindergarten on the first day, expecting nothing, and he came running home, and he burst in the back door of the house, and he said, Mom, Mom, he said, guess what? They want me back. <laughs> they want me back. Beloved, that's what the Father is saying here. He's saying, I share the extreme pain that you're going through. What you must do next, I understand, but I want you to know you've done the job to perfection up to this point. There's no alternative to the cross, but when that's over, I want you back. If you don't think that was affirming to Jesus, you don't understand Jesus in his humanity. I want you back. So, my beloved congregation, are you understanding, beginning to understand that Christianity is not easy? It's not what so many of us have been told growing up. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for those who just, quote, accept Christ and then sit back and live a life of ease. Christianity is for those who will, quote, deny self, take up their cross daily, and follow me. His is not an easy path. But the Father encouraged Jesus himself on his way by showing him what was to come. And he encouraged the disciples in the same way by showing them what was to come. And then he encourages us in the same way by giving us this account in three Gospels to show us this is where you're headed. This is where we're going. This is what the prize is that's out there. This is why you live for tomorrow instead of today. Paul said it this way in Romans 5 too. He said, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You have to look way beyond now in order to do that, right? But that's what, that's what God's asking us to do. The kingdom preview is intended to help us do that. Paul prayed for the Ephesians. He says, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Why did Paul want them to know the hope of his calling? So that they would live today in light of tomorrow. And that's what Jesus is doing at the transfiguration. That's what it's all about. Transfiguration is intended to lift our eyes beyond the sacrifices that are going on today to the riches of life tomorrow when it will be worth it all. It's like that old song, you know, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. All trials will seem so small when we see him. George Guthrie in his little book called Read the Bible for Life, which I would commend to you, it's a great book, but he tells of watching a children's movie with his daughter one night when she was just little. It was a cartoon thing, you know, but the scary part came and the music changed and uh, the whole tone changed and the little girl got scared and she snuggled up to dad and eventually he noticed she had her eyes closed. She couldn't stand to watch the witch or whatever it was. He turned to her and he explained to her, he said, listen, it's going to be okay. This is the crisis, but things are going to get better. And then he made this comment, this comment. He says, knowing the ending of the story changes everything. That's what the transfiguration is about. It's to tell us the end of the story. It's to let us see the shore that we can't see through the fog of our own ignorance. To see where we're going. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this preview of what's coming. Thank you that you took the time to encourage the disciples who were totally confused by this time. Thank you that you took the time to encourage your son, who in his humanity was just really recoiling at the thought of the death that he was going to have to suffer. But you knew it was necessary. 
He knew it was necessary and how you encouraged him. Encouraged him by asking him to look ahead. Help us to look ahead for our good, for your glory, so that we learn to trust you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.